Austrian, Swamish, and Slavic nations. Uh, a place which has long served as how we can exchange among people, uh, as we are doing this evening. And uh, by saying this, we want to acknowledge that we want to be inclusive and responsive to the needs of our members and the community. To acknowledge that uh, it is part of recognition and respect, which we uh, are important elements of better relationships and part of the reconciliation process. So on behalf of Swiss and all the girls and women who have come before, welcome. Uh, thank you to the candidates for their service to Canada, helping to inform the needs of their party's platform and uh, participating in our democratic process. Thank you to the organizers, the Society for Canadian Women in Science and Technology, SWIS, IEEE, Women in Engineering, uh, West Coast Women in Engineering, Science and Technology, WS, and Vote Science. I feel like most people here are going to be actively voting, uh, but just a reminder that advanced polls open this weekend, Friday to Monday. Uh, on a final note, you may be wondering who I am and what I'm doing here. Um, unfortunately, Michelle Obama couldn't make it, so <laughs> they called me uh, in such a situation. I'm a medical doctor, and uh, so I'm kind of stand adjacent, I feel. And this is my first federal election as a Canadian citizen. So I'm going to hand it over to Kelly, uh, uh, who will be uh, moderating this event. Thank you very much. So to take off the, the, the debate, we just want to go over the format that we have. Um, I will really share it with candidates, but just so everybody in the audience is, is on the same page. Um, so it is more of a formal debate. So each candidate will first start with a two-minute introduction of themselves. Uh, then we go into a short lightning round, so one to three kind of words per answer or uh, question. Uh, we'll go into the debate questions. I will ask the question twice to give you as an opportunity, and we will rotate through who answers first for each question. Um, for it, you will be given 90 seconds to answer. Um, and then, as you just hit hand out, you do have one rebuttal to use throughout the event, um, and it's for 60 additional seconds, whether you want to use it right then or after somebody's answered and, and use it at that point. So, uh, up to you uh, how you want to use that, but you do have that, that one opportunity. And at the end, uh, I will let you know when it's our last question. And then at the very after the last question, you will each have three minutes to final remarks, any additional rebuttals that you'd like to do. So um, if during the event you want to take notes, feel free to do that, um, you know, and then prep for that. Um, up front, Maria, who just hands you your rebuttal cards, she will be giving you some time uh, markers. So she has a sign for one minute left, 30 seconds left, 10 seconds left, and then time off. We will be firm on the timing, um, both myself, and we've learned how to use a mute button uh, up in the front, at the back there. If it comes to that, we've shared with all of you in advance that, uh, yeah, we're talking over. Everybody's here wants to hear all the candidates, what they have to say uh, for it. Uh, any questions? Okay, okay perfect. So, um, we will start with introductions. I'll start on my left here. Um, and Maria, let us know when you're ready to start timing. <clears throat> Hi, so I'm uh, Nearest Rorca and I live in Burnaby. I'm actually running as a libertarian with the New Westminster Burnaby Riding. This is actually my second time running in politics. I ran in 2017 as a BC libertarian in the Burnaby Wilby Riding. Uh, I didn't win, so I'm not currently in MLA, unfortunately. But uh, this is my second time here, and I hope to uh, you know, get some votes, and maybe I might even have a job in Ottawa. So I'll talk a bit about myself personally, and then I'll move into a little bit about my party. So I was born in Ontario, and I grew, uh, basically moved all over Canada. I had the fortune to live in uh, small towns all over, so I have an appreciation of the small town life, which I think is one of the incredible experiences here in Canada. I uh, lived in Quebec for several years, je peux parler français, and ultimately I came here to British Columbia. I went to high school in Burnaby, Caribou Secondary School and uh, went to Simon Fraser University with a degree in computer science. So with respect to the Libertarian Party, we really believe in having a fine balance between 
social uh, freedoms, which is what the left side talks about, and fiscal freedoms, which is the right side talks about. And then the unfortunate thing with our political spectrum is we've got uh, people on the left side, whether it's the Liberals or the Greens or the NDP, that are constantly talking about spending money without any real way to explain how that's going to happen. And then you've got people on the right side that are talking about uh, fiscal freedoms, but they don't really you know, care about the person and they don't want to protect the individuality and the rights of the people. My party is here to explore real problems and find solutions that work. We believe in the how, not just the what. We're not going to talk about fixing problems without finding real solutions based on facts. So definitely look forward to talking to some of you and uh, thanks for having me. I think a uh, applause is fine and at this point, but during the debate, uh, we'll just hold the applause between each speaker. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for having me. And I'd also like to start with a territorial acknowledgement. We are the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slayoto people. And I'd like to start saying also that it isn't enough to acknowledge the lands. We must also acknowledge that colonialism and genocide are ongoing in this country, and we must constantly work to do better. So about me, I just finished my PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of California, Santa Cruz in June. And while I was a student there, I was the president of Women in Physics and Astronomy where, and um, a member of Women in Science and Engineering, where I worked on diversity of every kind in, in the sciences and also specifically in physics, which is still an extremely non-diverse space, to put it mildly. Um, now I'm running with the Green Party of Canada in Burnaby North Seymour, and I am, have also been appointed the Science and Innovation Policy Critic for the party, and have been working on policy to do with technology. So looking at what's happening with AI and automation and the coming technological revolution that will likely change a lot in our society. I'm also, of course, continuing work in diversity and finding that politics is usually, or perhaps not surprisingly, similar to academia. So supporting evidence-based policies for diversity work there, and I look forward to continuing that work and your questions. Thank you. Um, in addition to the land acknowledgement, which is really important, I want to also say that Vancouver East, the riding that I'm seeking to represent as a member of Parliament, we have one of the largest or one of the largest urban indigenous populations in all of Canada. So it's really critical that our riding and Vancouver in general be leaders nationally in reconciliation. Uh, I mentioned that I'm seeking the, non or seeking the Member of Parliament for Vancouver East. My name is Kyle Demas, and I'm in the Liberal Party. I have been in Vancouver East for just over 10 years. I moved to Canada to do a PhD at the University of British Columbia in marine biology. And I wasn't initially planning on staying, uh, but I moved here and saw mountains for the first time, snow for the first time, social health care, gay equality, a lot of things that became really central in my life and have set roots here. Uh, I've now worked at Simon Fraser University as a postdoctoral fellow with indigenous communities on the central coast studying fisheries. And then I've worked at UBC, like I mentioned. I did some, some of the initial work on the ecological assessment of the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion. I've worked on climate change, uh, pollution, etc. And now I've, I've sort of blossomed my career from doing my own research, which I still continue, to also doing research leadership and research strategy. So, for two and a half years, I was at UBC as the senior advisor to the vice president of research, looking at how we can support collaborative research and working towards collaborative goals on big issues like climate change. I'm now the director of the large-scale grants office at Simon Fraser University, sort of doing the same thing of making sure that we are working together with large-scale industry and communities and other institutions towards these, these goals. And um, I see I'm almost out of time, so I'll finish up with the questions later on on how I've been involved with equity and research. Thank you. You guys set the bar high, I have to stand up. Uh, we're set. Um, you guys try if I sit, I've got a bad knee. Okay. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Kathleen Dixon, I'm running in Vancouver Water for the Conservative Party. I graduated from UBC with a degree in geology, and then I went on to do my MBA in Durham, England. I'm as comfortable as looking at rocks in the field in my rain gear as I am sitting in a boardroom. My career has included both working in mining and energy sectors, 
And uh, for the last 10 years, I've been an investment banker working in mergers and acquisitions. And I believe my business experience will allow me to be an effective MP for Vancouver Quadra. So in my career, I've often been the lone female, whether it's been in northern mining camps, on drill rigs, or even in boardrooms. And, and I think this must change. Over the course of my 30 years in business, though, I'm starting to see it change. Now I see many smart, motivated women, engineers, scientists, computer programmers, and investment bankers in my business who are challenging that status quo. And I feel it's my duty, but also my privilege, to help and mentor these women who, to succeed in any way I can, because they will break that glass ceiling and they will go beyond where I have. So as a single mom with two amazing kids, juggling a career and family hasn't always been easy. And I had lots of help along the way in the form of family, friends, and colleagues who would support my very hectic schedule. During these times, I've seen the positive impact of good paying jobs on families and communities, and most recently, I've seen the devastating impact on families and commu communities in losing those good paying jobs. So I stand before you as someone who's never been a politician, never thought of running for public office, but I'm here because I can no longer sit idly by and watch our country continue to lose ground because of a government that often seems more focused on defending itself. So thank you again for coming out, and I look forward to this evening. Thank you. So we're going to go to the lightning round. Um, so uh, a mix of uh, hopefully fun questions <laughs> as well as some serious questions as well. Uh, so let's kick off with, who's your favorite Canadian woman scientist? We started you, let's go. Right. Donna Strickland. I have to say that because I'm a physicist. <laughs> Kirsty Duncan, also Minister of Science. Dr. Kathy Hickson, volcanologist with the GSC. My mother, who's a scientist and did a really good job bringing me up. Nice. <laughs> Do you describe yourself as a feminist? Yes. Equalitist, if that's a word. Um, I don't believe in forcing equality. Equality has to happen naturally, so I am not a feminist. By the current definition, yes. What was your first programming language that you learned? DOS. Since I'm a software engineer, I'm going to say basic. R. Uh, do you consider climate change to be an emergency? No, climate change is not an emergency. Yes. Yes. No. What are you most adept at? Science, technology, engineering, or math? I'm most adept at math. Science, but I'd say interdisciplinarity. Science. What mode of transportation do you use to travel for this event? Electric car. 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 Jeep. What is your favorite BC craft beer? I don't drink beer, I drink wine. Favorite BC wine? Um, Silver Sage out of uh, Oliver. Okay. Faculty Brewers, Ginger Saison. <laughs> Yellow Dog, anything. Uh, I'm a wine drinker too, Burrowing Owl. Okay. What was the last national park that you visited? Seymour. Banff. Uh, Tombstone Park in Yukon Territory. Will you protect a woman's right to choose and her body autonomy? Absolutely. 100%. Complicated question. It depends on at what point in time and the way the nine months. Yes. What was the last country that you visited? United States. U.S. South Korea. U.S. 
What was the last book that you read? <laughs> the Policy Handbook. <laughs> That's legitimate. That's a lot of reading. <laughs> Uh, Confessions of a Green Peace, Green Peace Activist. The Binti Trilogy. The Remedy on Queer Health. Okay, okay so we're going to go into the prepare questions now. So just a reminder that, uh, so 90 seconds that you have per response, Maria will give you your countdowns, and you do have your one rebuttal that you're able to use throughout. Um, and I will also flag when it's our last question that we go through. So first question. Women make up about 52% of the electorate in Canada, and they tend to remain undecided about their choice longer than men. 40% of the people that filled our pre attendance survey tonight uh, consider themselves undecided. In response to this, how does your party expect to attract votes from undecided women and men? So since we started the, the gender conversation, I will first say that um, the Liberal government has been very important on advancing that file and seeing that cabinet parity was a really important piece for me. I work at universities, which I mentioned, and even six or seven years ago, hiring was based on fit, and fit based on what was there a long time ago is what we continue to hire. Um, when Kiersey Duncan, Minister of Science, I'm gonna mention her name a lot because she's my role model here, um, when she came in, she started talking about equity, and no, this is going fast. Um, she started talking about equity, and people weren't taking that very seriously, but the second year that she was in, she started putting it as attached to, um, to funding. And so the universities that were taking this seriously and that were looking at equity principles as rigorously as the rest of the academic proposal were now getting more funding. And all of a sudden, four years later, equity is now one of the primary decision-making criteria that we have in universities across the board. And seeing that level of change has been huge. And I want to apply that same lens to everything that we do. So to attract female voters uh, to the conservative, what I've been finding at the doors when I've been out door knocking is uh, it really resonates with them that we um, that we get the debt under control. They're concerned about that. They're also concerned about uh, stable funding for healthcare and social services, and the conservative platform is keeping those stable uh, and increasing those 3% uh, year on year so that you can rely on your hospitals. Uh, they're also um, concerned about the cost of living. Now, Vancouver is a very expensive place to live, and conservatives have uh, brought on um, uh, a proposal for no tax on maternity benefits, paternity benefits. Uh, which will help save money for young parents that uh, you know that are, are staying home with their little babies, and they're also going to help out with the uh, universal tax credit. So we're attracting um, lots of, of women voters at the door just by the pragmatic approach to um, making ends meet in their home, combined with uh, quite a strong economic and uh, environmental platform that really supports green tech and getting investment back in Canada that will move forward our green platform. So my party believes in, in liberty, and while I answer the question I'm not a feminist, I do believe in enabling so that equality can be reached. I don't think equality is something you can force upon people, but I think you might get create policies so that people can at least have a fair opportunity to achieve equality to excel wherever they want to. And I think that the problem that we've been facing in our society, and this is nothing new, this has been going on for years and years and years. Um, me personally, my own family, I have very strong female role figures, and so um, role models, so I, I really want to see that women can excel, and I see that even now, despite where we've gotten versus 30 or 40 years ago when my mom came here from India, there's still a disparity, whether it's in salaries or whether it's stuff that doesn't even happen in the open. So for me, my party is about enabling people, it's about changing the system, it's about going in and finding real solutions to problems. You constantly hear people talking in very vague terms about how they're going to work towards enabling women to do things, but they don't actually talk with specifics, and the reason is because they can get called out upon it four years later and say, well, you didn't do that and that and that. I'm the only person that's actually going to talk about actual specific things that I will do, my party will do, to ensure that women are empowered and, of course, they'll be you know, considering my party for the, uh, the next election. 
I think there's a lot of undecided voters of all kinds of gender now, and the way I see it is it has to do with what politics has become. It's a very divisive space. It's very can be a very ugly space, and I think that no matter what the parties actually offer, there's a lack of conversation and alienation happening for everyone. So what we're trying to do is bring the conversation back to representation, and having conversations about different ideas from different places and how to actually solve our problems based on evidence. And through opening up that conversation in communities, making sure that we talk to everyone equally. And also, personally, I've been trying to open up the gender equity debate to move beyond the gender binary, because I think that we can't get to true gender equity unless we're treating all people equally, kind of in all spheres. Thank you. Next question. Evidence helps decision makers effectively weigh what complex options and make fully informed decisions that benefit all Canadians. What will you do to support the chief science officer role, including departmental science advisors? I'll repeat the question. Evidence helps decision makers effectively weigh complex options and make fully informed decisions that benefit all Canadians. What will you do to support the chief science advisor role, including departmental science advisors? I will advocate strongly for having independent pure science in, uh, in Ottawa. As a scientist who worked for the Geological Survey of Canada, we spent about 120 days every summer mapping the geology um, of the Hideaway Islands along the west coast of Vancouver Island, the mountains in the Tombstone Range. We were up in the Arctic. I even got to map the Whistler map sheet, which, uh, which was quite, I mean, it was a beautiful place to work. Um, and that pure science set the basis for a lot of continuing work. So the, the, um, the forestry companies would use our maps, the um, mining companies would use our maps, the marine companies would use our maps. And, and it really formed a very strong uh, basis for companies in order to get their work done. And they didn't have to do that very basic science. So, I mean, I, I realize my experience um, can be modeled in all of the other disciplines, but I think the pure science needs to be advocated for that isn't biased by uh, commercial interests. We need the, the proper answers, and, and we don't need um, the commercial people influencing what those pure answers are from the science. I have a question about that later. So. <laughs> Um, so it's a, it's a great question. I actually just came from an event at the uh, Vancouver Food Bank in Burnaby, and we were talking about uh, you know nutrition and obesity, and why is it that we have this epidemic, and yet, yet the government seems to be in charge with things, and every four years we have some government that's claiming they know what they're doing, but they're not. And, and ultimately this comes down to the fact that you have special interest groups, companies, that are ultimately bribing the government. It's a bribe. I mean, you can call it a donation, you can call it whatever you want, but at the end of the day, if somebody's giving money to a, an MP to achieve a certain goal, that's a bribe. So, uh, I, I'm not interested in science being influenced by any sort of commercial interests. At the end of the day, if you're interested in making sound, solid decisions about the direction of your government and policies you're going to make, you have to accept the fact that math doesn't lie. That's why I answered that math was the most important thing to me. And you base your decisions on science, on mathematics, not on what money would be supposed to receive by your party. So my policy would be to base things on science and keep things transparent, to cut those ties and ensure that there's legally no way for uh, the government to be influenced by special interest groups or any sort of commercial interest that stand in the way of blocking science from making us, uh, enabling us to make good decisions. We are really happy that the Chief Science Officer is back. Thank the current Liberal government for reinstating the position. We would like to see that it is further protected and continued so that it actually gets to stay and doesn't have any limits. We also want to make sure that the work done in the Chief Science Office, Chief Science Advisor's Office, is actually respected and listened to and does fully influence policy and just recommendations. We'd also like to see that role be copied and kind of within every department so we have a Chief Science Advisor for every single ministry and also ensure that they have the ability to put out reports and then also a framework to make sure that the policy that actually gets based on those reports 
is actually based on that evidence and isn't just kind of like, oh, we have a report now and then we make this policy, but have a connection between the science officers and the advice on the evidence to the actual policy making. I was also very happy about the reinstatement of that position. It's so critical to have a full-time position whose mandate is to bring the best evidence out there to the decision-making table. So absolutely, we'll continue to support that. Um, and other versions of that in other specific departments reporting in would be great. Um, I'll also say that I, the Canadian Science um, Policy Fellowship, so we're starting to get more people that are scientists into policy, and I want to see that. When I first moved here, I mentioned over a decade ago now, I was working on things like climate change and an ecological assessment of the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion, and I couldn't interface with my colleagues in government. Um, I would try and go to Department of Fisheries and Oceans as one of the only academics working on this, and I wasn't able to, and that's because they were muzzled. So one of the first things the liberal government did was unmuzzle scientists, and that was the start to showing how important science is for that government. Um, and I want to make sure that we continue to build those structures, like having a science minister who is a scientist and a chief science advisor. And we're, we're pushing universities to also find new ways of collaborating with government because scientists want to collaborate. All of the issues that we're working on now require collaboration to solve them. So I'm committed to making sure we're making that there are the structures in place to allow that. Absolutely. Thank you. Investments in research are critical for maintaining our international competitiveness, training the next generation of business and scientific leaders, and continuing to build on the many benefits that past investments in research have yielded for Canadians. Do you believe that current levels of federal support for science are sufficient to meet the federal government's responsibilities? And if not, how do you propose to increase or decrease these funds over the next five years? I'll repeat the question. Investments in research are critical for maintaining our international competitiveness, training the next generation of business and scientific leaders, and continuing to build on the many benefits that past investments in research have yielded for Canadians. Do you believe that current levels of federal support for science are sufficient to meet the federal government's responsibilities? And if not, how do you propose to increase or decrease these funds over the next five years? So the question, uh, pardon me, seems a bit loaded because it's suggesting that the government actually should be the one going in and giving support to these industries, which I actually disagree with. I think that uh, in general, with some exceptions, the government is incapable of running programs efficiently and it's actually uh, the responsibility of the government, or new government to come in to hand the responsibility over to those industries so that they can innovate and they can work efficiently. I have worked both in government and in private industry, both in Canada and the United States. And I can tell you that as a scientist and also as a business person, it's incredibly frustrating to see the kind of inefficiencies that the governments operate with. I've always excelled working in smaller businesses where we have a huge incentive to innovate and ultimately to survive in a competitive marketplace. And I feel that if we want to be competitive, the best way to do it is not to um, have programs coming from the government that are driven by higher taxation and bureaucracy, but rather we cut the taxes, eventually eliminate the taxes, so that people uh, have a, an incentive to start businesses, uh, small businesses have an incentive to grow, they have an incentive to work harder and go that extra mile, knowing that they can keep that money and they're incentivized to compete. This is exactly what I see in countries that uh, have uh, you know, less government involved, and that is the best way to increase our competitiveness. So we, we think that science is still underfunded in, in Canada, and um, we're really happy to have the Naylor Report, the Fundamental Science Review that was commissioned. But what it says is that we're really not meeting what we need in terms of fundamental science funding, and this is not just within government agencies, but also within our universities. And I especially, just because I was just recently a grad student, always look at the portion of graduate studies and postdoctoral research and say, yes, well, there's so much going on here that is necessary. So we support and have costed full funding for all the recommendations of the uh, Fundamental Science Review. And I think that the key here is that when we're looking at an economy that functions well in the future, which should be based on innovation and science and technology, we want to make sure that what's driving that is well supported, and that is absolutely fundamental science as well as general sciences, both in academics, within the government, and within private industry. 
glad you mentioned the Naylor report. I, it's great just following you because I'm going to echo a lot of that. Um, the Naylor report, after a long time of conservative government under Harper, we knew that the research had been underfunded and the structures of universities weren't where the liberal government thought they should be. And so we commissioned this large scale lead. And it was fairly ambitious and it was fun to see as a research administrator all the great things that we were going to be doing. Um, so yes, we definitely recognize that it was underfunded and I think that it still is. And as a researcher, I wanna make sure that we are getting more money. I will say some of the things that I have seen that I think are very inspiring, programs like Canada Foundation for Innovation used to have very sporadic funding. One government would come in and say, here's a couple hundred million dollars and here quickly do a program. And, and universities couldn't plan for that. And now we've just stabilized their funding. So now it's gonna be constant over time. It's not the big spike. So universities can start planning for that. And so using the same money a little bit more um, in a planned way allows us to, without even putting more money in, have a higher return on investment. But I do think that if you look across, uh, across the world, we don't invest as much per capita in research as we should. We're moving in the right direction and uh, I wanna continue to advocate for that, absolutely. So investing in R&D uh, will be what is one of the platforms for the green um, way forward that the conservatives have put in. And uh, so they'll be supporting um, R&D emissions uh, reduction technology. And those uh, are uh, research and development um, eligible will be uh, part of a pool that allows Canadian companies to combine investment on, on green tech. And Canadian green bonds or financial instruments will be introduced as well that are dedicated to investing in emissions reducing technology, which is something that, you know, that we can all buy and, and support and invest in those things as well as green tech companies piloting or adopting um, and getting them to the next level and helping them with that financing. So the Canadian University and Colleges programs that will advance the development of green tech will also be supported financially. And the final sort of boost for those companies going from the R&D stage into development stage uh, and eventually commercialization of their products will get the green patent credit which will reduce their tax rates to 5% on the green tech income from those Canadian technologies that are patent, patented and developed in Canada. So I think that will get them into that commercialization, it will create the jobs, and it will support the science that's going on at the fundamental basic level. Next question. Iceland became the first country to introduce legislation requiring employers to prove they are paying men and women equally. This followed a successful introduction of gender ratios before reports. Swiss advocates for board and executive teams to be 40, 40, 20. So 40% men, 40% women, and 20% whatever kind of mix. How will your party ensure a similar closing of the gender gap in the private sector and ensure that the science and technology workforce reflects their diverse population? Very interesting question because I actually have some qualms with it, quotas. Because what, in my experience, enforcing quotas has actually sometimes resulted in putting underrepresented gender identities in positions where they are not actually in a place that's welcoming at all. So they're then not fully supported, not in a safe environment. That being said, I think in some cases it's very important to do. So when it comes to equal pay, absolutely, we need to make sure that every gender is equally paid for equal work, 100%, and legislated. But when it comes to quotas for positions, I think we need to have some of them very lightly, and then also make sure that we're looking at inclusivity of all the workspaces and kind of general access to programs, so that when people arrive there, when they're put in those positions, regardless of their gender, they're actually welcome, comfortable, and safe. So the Liberal government has put into place an emphasis in universities on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I mentioned it's become something that we have to in every proposal address. And now it's a differentiator of success in all proposals. So a lot of people are getting the check marks for their research excellence, but they're really differentiating how they're doing equity. So more and more scrutiny is going into that at, at every university. And I'll say that's been really transformative because not only are we looking at that with hiring processes, and having to show evidence that our process isn't biased, which is, you know, nothing like this would have existed four years ago, it's having real impact. But we're going to other levels and looking at 
um, what's the time to promotion for male versus female and all the other equity seeking groups and we're looking at student fellowships and I'll give you just a, another example. Um, there's an organization called MyTax which provides student funding which is really transformative. Um, and as we started drilling into the data, we noticed that there was a difference where there was less women interns than we thought there would be based on the enrollment data. Um, and we looked at MyTax and we looked through their process, and their process wasn't biased, but as we started looking at the data, we were able to follow and see it was a few departments, and it was really the department chairs who were discouraging women from taking these industry positions. So it's only because we started really drilling down in the data that we were able to identify these issues and start tackling them. So gender equality, um, we certainly support equal pay for equal work, and uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked in business for long enough to recognize that uh, that has to be, otherwise all your very strong female workers are gonna walk out on you. Uh, we don't believe in quotas either, and it's a merit-based economy, so individuals are recognized for their education, their experience, and their community contributions. Uh, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or religion. And I, um, you know, as a, a I'm, I'm part of a women on boards group, and a lot of quotas have been put forward for, for women on boards, and companies have been shown to succeed and exceed expectations when they have a certain number of women that sit on the boards. And what we're finding is as more women get involved and network and, and meet the, uh, you know, the presidents and uh, chairman of these boards, they start to get in. And uh, it, it's a very slow process, um, and it's taking a long time, but we're starting to see the wheels rolling, especially in very traditionally mining, oil and gas, and finance companies. But we are starting to see more women get on those boards and break those glass ceilings. So, um, you know, Inequality can can be a problem in certain cases, but I don't think we can look at this so simply and think that we need to force equality because sometimes solutions to creating equality actually create all sorts of other problems. Uh, for example, my family comes from India, and I've got cousins in India, and they try to get into some of these universities. Unfortunately, some of my family members happen to be in a certain class, um, economic class, where the competition to get in is high enough that they can't get in, even with certain grades, and someone in the lower class is getting in with much lower grades. And this is ultimately creating inefficiencies. I mean, if you're running a company, you need to choose in a competitive environment, and we were talking earlier about competitiveness, you need to choose the best candidates for the job, period. That's how you do it. And if it happens to be a man, so be it. If it happens to be a woman, so be it. The real problem then, if you're seeing inequality, is systemic where men might be tending to go and study sciences and mathematics and engineering and women are not doing that and that is the problem that you need to solve. I took computer science at Simon Fraser University in the 1990s and I can tell you that 95% of my fellow classmates were, were masculine, were male. That's a problem. Ultimately, you're going to end up with a situation where your workforce is primarily male. If you really want to go and create equality, go to the source and go to the schools and find out where that inequality is happening and solve it there. Don't force equality because it's not, it's going to create all sorts of other problems. It's not a solution. Hey, we have our first rebuttal. Okay, I have to rebut that. Um, so, since I've worked in diversity and sciences a lot, I have to say that yes, there are ways to enforce and there are ways to not. We have to look at the core problems of why we don't have diversity. But some of the systems that have been put in place are there because there are systemic inequalities that have been forced over generations of people being kept out, whether for some socioeconomic reason, racial reason, gender reason, and they may not work perfectly but we cannot ignore the systemic bias and the need to fight implicit bias in our systems by a variety of programs. So it is complex, but to say that some systems that are put in place because of in kind of saying, well, these people should have more access, there are good reasons for a lot of those programs and we should not just say we shouldn't do them. Thank you. Natural scientists point to global limits in economic growth and question the prevailing political framework of persistent growth. 
How do you reconcile expectations for growth and prosperity with the finite limits of our planet? Natural scientists point to global limits, to economic growth, and question how the prevailing political framework of persistent growth. How do you reconcile expectations for growth and prosperity with the finite limits of our planet? Great question. Thank you for that. Absolutely, the, the few generations before us were really focused on growing, growing, growing to get ahead, to get advantage, and, and that's, that's what's got us to the situation where we're in now, where we're learning that we're actually close to the limits of the planet. And so it's the challenge of our generation to readjust that and realize that we are part of the ecosystem and we're just a part of the planet. We can't just do anything we want. We still have to live within the constraints of the ecosystem. And that's the situation we're in now. And that, that is the greatest challenge of our time. And it's comforting to me to see that that's where scientists are going now. How can we increase the resilience of ecosystems so that we can operate within their limits um, while benefiting from them without destroying them? Um, and, and at the same time, so you probably saw the Liberals notice, or the Liberals announced they were going to do plant two billion trees. The interesting part about that for me was it was the first time I saw a government say, the only way we're going to be able to start combating this is if we're really restoring nature, because nature has this important role to play in, in our ecosystem, and if we're not respecting that, we're, we're not going to be able to live within it. I think, uh, you know, in order to sort of Halt, I don't want to say halt, the exponential population growth. Uh, I think that is the fundamental um, stressor on our, on our poor earth. And uh, really to lift people out of poverty actually brings down and stabilizes population growth. So I think what you know, Canada can do is export clean tech, clean energy, and let those um, uh, third world countries lift up their standard of living so that they can have uh, power, they can have clean water, they can have regular food, and then their um, societies will thrive, and their populations will start to stabilize, and uh, you know demands on the globe will will stabilize, uh, as well as developing all that green tech uh, in those third world countries will also help to clean up the air. It'll you know break down demand on uh, on resources, and. Uh, Overall, the whole world will will be a better place and have lower emissions and cleaner air, and uh, you know be able to sustain us. So I like to look at uh, living on planet Earth like living in the International Space Station. You got ten people on the International Space Station, nine of them are smoking, and you're not, and you're choking on it, and you seem to be wondering, well, if you stop smoking, keep not smoking, is that going to solve the problem? It's not. Canada is contributing less than 5%, if that, in terms of global warming pollutants in the world. And it's very simple why. You look at our pollution, you look at the size of this country, you just look at the size of our GDP or our industries, we're nothing compared to larger countries. If you look at the actual statistics, if you look at where the plastics are in the oceans, if you look at the sources of all that industry, it's coming from countries in Asia. And you know, you can look that up on the internet. So my question to you is. How much of a movement are we going to make with regards to this so-called climate crisis, even if we just turn everything off? We have to be practical about this. Uh, I'm not even here talking about whether or not there is a climate crisis or not, but even if there is one, Canada is not in a position within our own habits and what we're doing in our industries to actually make any usable impact on this. What we really need to do is get political and lobby our governments to ensure that the actual contributors to global warming, the ones that have unchecked industry, arguably, that are causing these problems are actually the ones that are under control. The problem doesn't exist here, it, it, it exists elsewhere. So I wonder where we are now with Earth Overshoot Day. Is it sometime in July and August, where we've used up the resources that we know we can recreate for our survival? I think that that tells us that we have a global problem. And it's true, it's kind of a much larger issue than just our country. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to develop a plan for the future, and a global plan, and perhaps leave that. And so I think it's time to start talking about the way we have structured our economy, and the idea that we want to survive on this planet for generations to come. And that means 
looking at regeneration. And it doesn't mean an end of growth. I think it means an end of overconsumption, but kind of intelligent growth that, that, that grows in the way we want, in well-being, in health, in our, in our prosperity, in the way we live our lives rather than in stuff. And in there, there is a fundamental change, but I think looking at our economies that way and looking at our industries that way, we can turn towards living in a way that will actually last forever. A flagship program of SWIST is our Immigrating Women in STEM program, as our additional barriers immigrants face when beginning their careers in Canada. And our community partners include newcomer resources like Mosaic, YWCA's Tech Connect, and International Immigrant Women in Science. How will your party encourage and support newcomers to Canada, including those internationally trained professionals, to achieve their full potential in Canada? A flagship program for SWIST is our Immigrating Women in STEM program, as there are additional barriers immigrant, uh, immigrant states when beginning their careers in Canada. And our community partners include newcomer resources like Mosaic, YWCA Tech Connect, and International Immigrant Women in Science. How will your party encourage and support newcomers to Canada, including internationally trained professionals, to achieve their full potential within Canada? A great question. Um, the, uh, the immigration policy was actually released today, and uh, it was announced that um, the Conservatives want to bring back compassion, fairness, and orderliness to our immigration system, so that there aren't uh, the third-party refugees coming in, they're going to close that loophole so that, that people that are safe coming across the border from the U.S. are, uh, are put into queue, and uh, most of the um, the refugees uh, that should be coming into Canada, that should be coming from places where they are unsafe and that they are uh, in desperate need of coming to Canada. So that said, your question about uh, um, qualified people coming into Canada, the, uh, the policy also uh, it is, is moving towards recognizing foreign degrees, foreign um, qualifications, so that, that those people can come into Canada and practice in the field that they're trained in. And I think that's really important with, uh, you know, getting them to uh, be happy, successful, contributing Canadians in the economy. So that, I think, is a very important thing, and the Conservatives are, are working towards that. Thank you. So the Libertarian Party has a very open uh, policy about immigration. We are all about uh, encouraging people of any sort of scientific ability, any advanced skills to be able to come here, because at the end of the day, that's good for the country. Uh, right now, we have a broken system that uh, you know, is full of delays, and ultimately, people that should have the ability to come and work here immediately are not able to. I see people driving cabs, I see people doing a lot of menial jobs, pardon my use of that terminology, when they really could be a, you know, contributing a lot more to the economy. So my uh, party's position on immigration would be to fast track anyone who has any sort of advanced education and can come here so that we can actually be competitive. There are resources available, there are people that want to come here, and it's just a matter of removing the bureaucracy and, and enabling that to happen. Um, in, in terms of the people here, yes, we have a lot of standards, we have a lot of bureaucracy in terms of agencies that are blocking people from getting jobs, going through all sorts of certifications. Uh, I, I know people here who have come here from uh, other countries with degrees in medicine and they have to get recertified. They have to go through all sorts of steps. I understand that there's a certain legal process, but we can fast track this and we can actually make our immigration system and the ensuing steps to become a professional much faster. So interestingly enough, I think the solutions to this relate to some of the policy I've been working on for, for preparing for AI and automation and the automation of work. Because when we talk about jobs that are being lost, a lot of people say, well, what about the ones that are currently occupied by immigrants? And the usual answer is, well, I can't define what someone's meaningful work is to start out with, but a lot of times because those people do not have access to the positions that they are trained for. So one of the big barriers is often language programs. So what we see for overall for job replacements, we need a guaranteed livable income, education programs, and also Therefore, language programs, job tracking, and making sure that degree certification isn't overly qualified. So while people are settling, they have the support they need to go through qualification, making sure that isn't as hard as it is now, and also language programs to make sure that it's a lot easier to integrate. I mentioned earlier that I was an immigrant to Canada, 
and I also recognized that I had that probably as easy as any immigrant possibly could, speaking English natively and being a white male and going after a PhD. That was about as easy as the immigration process could be. Since then, I have absolutely seen barriers across the board that people have, and the Liberal government is committed to making sure that not only are we bringing immigrants in, but we are integrating them into society. So, um, something I've heard several times up here is making sure that credentials in other countries are actually able to apply here. It's so critical. There are so many people who are trained and skilled that should and could be doing the work here. So we've just got to really work on that process to make that better. Um, and I do want to share one story. I pride myself in being really collaborative and clever and finding solutions to problems. But the first failure I had at Simon Fraser University was we had accepted a scholar at risk, which is a program where someone who, in a country they don't have academic freedom and they're at risk, are able to come to the country. Um, and I was very happy that we did that, but she came to me and said, I'm not eligible for any of these granting programs. So great that you were able to get me here. Now I can't do any of my research. And I tried everything I could and wasn't able to find something for her other than working with other people who had established labs. So there's lots of things in universities that I'd like to also work on, um, but I, I am committed to making sure we are enabling immigrants to succeed here. High quality, affordable childcare is known to support more women returning to the workplace and taking on more senior and higher paying technical and leadership roles. How is your party planning to improve access to childcare in the next five years? So high quality, affordable childcare is known to support more women in returning to the workplace and taking on more senior and higher paying technical and leadership roles. How is your party planning to improve access to childcare in the next five years? <clears throat> so, um, child care really is the responsibility of the parents. I mean, uh, I'm gonna, you know, my parents came here in the 70s. They came here with eight bucks in their pocket. They, as far as I know, didn't qualify for any sort of help. My mom and my dad were working very, very hard to get themselves into an economic position where they could provide for me and my brother. They were immigrants that faced racism and faced economic woes, and despite their education that they came here with from India, they were not able to get into the fields that they wanted to because of the very reasons we just discussed. So, you know, I think that ultimately this comes down to responsibility, and this is something that my party absolutely stands by, and it's the pride of taking responsibility. If you have kids, it's your responsibility to ensure, as, as, a, as a couple, whether it's uh, you know a man and a woman or two men or two women, to ensure that you have the economic ability to take care of your children as you're expected to by society. I don't think it is the responsibility of the, uh, the government to step in here and ensure that you can take care of your children. This is not really about uh, a woman or a man's rights. It's really about if you have children, you decide to adopt or have children, you have accepted the responsibility of taking care of them in whatever situation your life leads towards. I think a lot of this country is now in an affordability crisis where it takes more than two full-time salaries to actually live, which means that there is barely time now. And when it comes to equity, people need access to childcare. It has a lot to do with the way homes are set up now, the way we balance families and life, and a life that is now far more complicated than I think anyone was hoping or expecting it would be in 2019. So what we would like to see is a universal child care program, because we think that it's about time for that, and we've looked into funding as well, so it's costed, and so it would be in partnership with local provinces, but it's absolutely, I think, a necessary part of our future. It was hard hearing some of those opening statements about um, my partner and I are talking about having kids right now and we're having to save to be able to do that in a couple of years and we both have really well paying jobs for our, our stature and where we're at right now. Um, so that's a reality that people are facing and I don't think that people should ever have to say I can't, I can't have a kid so I'm gonna, you know, I can't afford to have kids so I either have to leave Vancouver or I just can't, I wanna make sure that everyone has the ability to have children and have a family so that, I need to say that first. Um, there's, but to your question specifically on, on child care, there, I think there's two components to that. One is access to child care facilities, and we know there's less of those. So we've already committed to a quarter million new child care facilities, so that's something we're working on. But the other component is affordability, and we can't, 
Um, we can't deny that. It's, it's an important thing on everyone's, uh, that, that everyone's facing. Uh, and we do have programs like the Canada Child Benefit that are providing subsidies for people who have children to be able to have access to resources like that. So the conservative um, position on this, uh, you know, is that our the, the Canada Child Care Benefit, which uh, which you spoke of, will not change uh, in order to support parents. Uh, but a universal uh, child care program is is certainly not something that we would be advocating for. Um, but making life more affordable, putting more money in your pocket, is something that conservatives will do, and that will go a long way in helping parents be able to afford child care. But then your point about access and actually finding a daycare for your kid, uh, that's, a little, that's a little more tricky. And I think you know, we need to um, go back. We had the, the Living Caregiver Program was a, was a great one for, for getting new Canadians into Canada, having them looked after. Uh, it certainly needs to be monitored. I, I certainly <coughs> use that as a uh, single mom. I had the Living Caregiver Program, but I couldn't afford it. So I had a couple of girlfriends and uh, we, us with our new babies, sort of, uh, we collaborated and we had uh, a caregiver pro, you know, program in, in our house. And uh, I think you have to look for those solutions. Um, we, we also used grandparents and aunts and uncles where we could. And uh, I think it's one of those, um, y you have to look for solutions and you have to be creative with child care. Yeah. Second one. Oh, go ahead. <coughs> So I've definitely had uh, heated conversations with people about the fact that I think that people need to be responsible for the uh, economic, um, uh, you know, realities of their life depending on the choices they make. I mean, I am well paid right now and I cannot afford to buy a house in Vancouver. Uh, I've heard stories in the news about people that are facing all sorts of ridiculous premiums on ICBC. Uh, the fact of the matter is living in Vancouver is incredibly expensive, and this is not a problem that you're seeing happening on the streets of East Hastings. It's happening in the middle and even upper middle class families. This is a problem that we're facing, and the solution to this is not a slippery slope where you start asking the government and society to start taking care of my car payments, my house payments. I ultimately, if I cannot afford to live here, I have to make some decisions, and it sounds harsh, but we have to solve the problem. If there's a housing cost issue, we solve it the right way. If I could use my rebuttal, okay. well, I don't yeah, know if I can rebuttal. Um, yeah, well, because it, it resonates with me and probably most people in Vancouver that, yes, I, I agree there's a fundamental structural issue that we have to be addressing, but it can't be at the expense of people's lives right now. I, I don't think it's acceptable for someone to say, I can't have a kid in the community I've always lived in, so I have to move somewhere else. That's not the type of society we want to build. So yes, we have structural issues we need to fix, but we absolutely do need support from the government until those are fixed to be able to continue living and building the society that we want. I don't need more time. I think I okay. said what <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Scientific integrity policies include that publicly funded research should be open to the public, federally funded scientists should be freely able to talk about their work, and scientific publications that result from, uh, resulting from publicly funded research should be published in open access platforms. How will you implement and ensure adherence to the scientific integrity policies? So, scientific integrity policies include that publicly funded research should be open to the public, Federally funded scientists should be freely able to talk about their work, and scientific publications resulting with, from publicly funded research should be published in open access platforms. How will you implement and ensure adherence to the scientific integrity policies? So we fully support the implementation of the scientific integrity policies. I'm not sure how, how, but um, it's one of the pieces we do have a plan for, for sure, and that is uh, open access. And so we're wanting to follow the Plan S that Europe has, which has an open access journals, basically, to make sure that all the funded research is available, and then also making sure that the other integrity policies are legislated. So I also completely support that. I think it's critical in society to make sure that we are having the evidence that we're producing and funding from taxpayers' funds to be able to be 
read by anyone in the public so that we can have this, this dialogue. And there has been a problem at universities of we fund money or we fund research as taxpayers for the research to happen and then they publish in a journal, but then if you want to access that, you have to pay to the journal. And that, it's something that we've been dealing with for a long time internationally and it seemed like it was running away. I will say the University of California system is giving us uh, an interesting insight of how things could be, where they just recently said that they were going to be boycotting some of these big groups. Best academic institutions in the world saying, you know what, we don't actually need you. And so I think the whole world is watching to see, okay, how will this play out if we're not publishing in these journals that are costing a lot of money? So absolutely, we need to continue to find ways to make sure that evidence is in the, um, in the public and people are able to dialogue. I certainly think as, as shareholders uh, in the Canadian government, which each one of us taxpayers is, uh, should be allowed to access those documents. I mean, I say that with a, a slight caveat. If someone's working on a um, potentially dangerous chemical or, you know, I think those things will obviously need to stay confidential or if it's some kind of, uh, you know, pure science that will help, wep you know, with weapons design or um, say, say power or, or those kind of things. Uh, that will give us a competitive advantage. Perhaps we don't want to um, publish those broadly, but uh, the theory of uh, the paper certainly sounds good. So I think this might not be, this might be quite possibly the least interesting question, no offense, because we all agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not everyone agrees to this, though. <laughs> Um, I, I basically believe that yes, we are all shareholders of the government and all the money that's being spent uh, in terms of research and that information belongs to the people. I'm not really big, as you can already tell, on government spending. I think it should, uh, you know, enterprises should be incentivized based on commercial interests to research things. But that having been said, any money being spent by the government, uh, the results of that are the fruits of the federal government's money and that should also really become available to the public. Uh, indeed, there can be exceptions. Um, you know, the Manhattan Project probably don't want to make that very public at the time. But, uh, you know, we have the internet available to us and we have fantastic technologies like blockchain, something I work on personally, uh, that I think are great places where uh, any sort of federal research, any products that come out of federal research funding can be put there and they become available for Canadians. I, I have personally went and looked for uh, publications that came out of uh, these programs, and yes, it is very annoying to have a paywall or any sort of friction to get access to that. So I completely agree with most of what I've heard here. Given the impact that climate and the environment have on people, businesses, and communities, how will your party support funding related to climate science and environmental monitoring? including such things as atmospheric climate science and climate-specific research facilities such as the Polar Environment Atmospheric Research Laboratory, commonly referred to as PEARL. Given the impact the climate and environment have on people, businesses, and communities, how will your party support funding related to climate science and environmental monitoring, including atmospheric climate science and climate-specific research facilities such as the Polar Environmental Atmospheric Research Laboratory? Sorry, yeah. um, great question. I appreciate that. As an ecologist, baseline data is the number one thing that we need. So we always start with observations, and you can only do that if you have observational data. I was privileged enough after my PhD um, and postdoc, actually, but before I started working at universities, to work for what's called the Hackeye Institute. I don't know if anyone's here has heard of it, but it was a model that um, it's philanthropic money that is going towards creating a marine research institute that is doing this type of monitoring in the central coast because we identified that there is a gap between Alaska and California because the U.S. is funding this type of research but the conservative government here wasn't. So now the liberal government has started putting more money into doing things like this but we have some really creative models in British Columbia alone and the Ocean Protection Plan which is a 1.5 billion dollar investment from our government, one of the pillars in that is collecting baseline data. Now, as a scientist, I also like to go in when you have these baseline monitoring and do experiments that couple with it. You can have people from all around the world come in and it does draw people from all around the world when you have these long-term monitoring um, setups to come do experiments to really disentangle uh, specific things that go with that, that data set. So um, that's a very specific question and, and really 
there isn't a lot of policy stuff that I have been given as guidance. Um, as far as uh, sovereignty of the North, I think keeping uh, scientists up in the North is, is key for Canada. Um, it's, it's an area that uh, I think is under threat from a lot of our neighbors, our polar neighbors. And uh, in order for Canada to make sure that the North stays true North, strong and free, um, we should have uh, the scientists up there have the, um, if you called it pearl, uh, yeah, and, and it's important to have our, our people on the ground up there and, and watching and seeing what's happening. Um, and uh, I think that, yeah, I don't know much about the rest of your question. I apologize. So I'm all for having data and uh, investing in the sciences at, at whatever level, especially at the you know, private level, to ensure that we're aware of what's going on. We live on this planet, as we know, the world keeps getting smaller and smaller. And we need to make decisions that are based on science and facts, not fear-mongering. Uh, unfortunately, I've been observing in the last few weeks that despite all the science and all the facts that we have in the world, there's still a great deal of uh, climate emergency uh, actions going on, activism going on, that I feel are quite contrary to science we know. So I think that part of the problem is we do have facts, and people are just cherry-picking what they want to suit their own political agenda. It's definitely very important for us to continue monitoring what's going on. I do agree that, for example, there is a little warming going on, but it's important to assess what's the cause of it. Uh, where is it coming from and what can we do to deal with it? So in, in terms of funding and ensuring that we're you know, monitoring, especially with Canada and the landmass that we have, I'm absolutely for support of, of it as long as we understand that this is um, a scientific effort and this is not something that we're doing in response to some sort of irrational form of thinking. Thank you. I think we've been very concerned that uh, funding has not been fully restored for Pearl or continued for Pearl and also a lot of our climate science. So um, I think I got sent this recommendation from Evidence for Democracy and I submitted it to my party and said, you really have to fund this? And they're like, yeah, okay, so it's in our platform. That we fully funding it. I was wondering how it turned out to be super easy. I'm like, wait, that's, that's how that worked. I just advised you on the policy. And you're like, yeah, cool, I believe you. That's good. Um, I do want to address, though, the idea of the climate emergency. And, you know, it's true that here, all the data shows that we're um, warming twice as fast as the parts of the world, it might not feel like we're in an emergency. But I think in that, we're forgetting the people that are already experiencing an emergency across the global south, the people who are dealing with overwhelming droughts we've never experienced before, flooding, sea level rise. So I have personal experiences in extreme weather. It may not have been climate driven, but my house was lost, my mother was lost in the mudslide. So it doesn't really matter to me why this is happening. We think, we, we, we believe the climate scientist consensus, but the truth is, there's on the ground effects that we need to be prepared for, and gathering the data and preparing for those should not be partisan or considered scientific or unscientific. I just want to follow up with what she said. Um, I completely agree. Uh, we need to see the science, we need to see the evidence, because uh, I, you probably watched uh, Patrick Moore's video, um, and you, you referred to his book, and you know, there's evidence, he, he brings evidence out of, um, you know, that the, the oceans are not rising, and CO2 is actually what makes plants grow, and so I think there's a lot of confusion for a lot of us, and so I agree, we need that evidence-based science that, that makes it clear, that makes it clear for, um, and I, I don't like the words and the language that's being bandied about, so it's, you know, the, the alarmists versus maybe the not alarmists. And uh, I mean, I'm confused by it. And I know the kids are terrified by it. And I don't like that language being used for our kids um, because it isn't a fire, it's not a tsunami. So I, I reserve the word emergency for those things. Yeah, well, this may only be one, right? We did read some topics. Some were easy, guys all agree, and others not enough. Some diversion opinions there. Okay, uh, in the last federal election, women made up 26% of the MPs elected and made up 50% of the current cabinet ministers. For this current year's election, how will your party ensure that there is equal representation of women in government? Oops. 
So I mentioned early, earlier that in the last election when the liberals took power, they did ensure cabinet parity for gender. And that was the first time this had happened. And it was a big move and everyone asked and we said, well, it's time. Uh, but that, that's a, there's a big reflection in that, that I think that um, we need to, that was an important first step. But I'm being interviewed actually just after this about queer representation in politics because there's other components of representation that are still underrepresented. So we definitely need more women in politics. And the women that I've met in politics so far, I mentioned Kirsty Duncan, um, all of the, the political role models that I have are women. And I think that when we have women in politics, we do have better politics, so full stop there. Um, but we also need to move the gender conversation beyond that. I don't know of any openly trans people running for office. Maybe they're there, but I don't know of any because there's not a profile. Um, and the queer representation is still quite a bit lower. Then we have visible minorities and indigenous people. So there's a lot of representation that is still lacking in politics. And one more thing I'll say on that is scientists. I think that we have an over-representation of politicians in politics, and it would be great to see people from other walks of life, especially science and politics. So the conservative government does not support quotas, um, but we do support a merit-based advancement. Um, in this election, uh, candidates that are women are 40%, um, and they are in winnable ridings. Uh, one article I read said, oh, but they're not in winnable ridings. But they are, uh, you know, just a couple of examples. We've got Leona Aguaklurik, like probably not pronouncing that correctly, in Nunavut, and uh, Tanya Corbett down in Delta, and uh, Tamara Jansen in Cloverdale Langley, Tracy Gray in Kelowna. Um, and these are very high qualified run, r women running with strong track records. Um, the Women on Boards group as well, you know, we're advancing the women forward uh, there. And they're advocating. So I got a lot of support when I ran from women on boards, you know, to step forward out of private practice as a scientist, because I agree with you, um, and someone that wasn't a professional politician. And uh, so I think um, when, when uh, the government is formed after the 21st, it will be a merit-based, but there are enough strong women running that it will have that, that balance that people are looking for. So I, I think there's a pretty large disparity between the male to female ratio in, in politics. Uh, I, you know, I go to a lot of events and I see that and it's quite obvious. And um, while I don't think you can force it to become equal, you can do things to encourage it to become equal by natural means. So for example, you know, you know, amongst uh, libertarians, but even with computer scientists, I find that there's uh, just a tendency for women to not want to participate. And, you know, this is ultimately beyond my understanding. I'm not a psychologist. But I, I think that there's things that we can do to address this and encourage uh, women to get involved. I definitely think that it's much better, and I think the outcomes would be better if you had a better uh, even uh, ratio. You know, the fact is we have approximately 50% women and 50% men in this country, and it's important that they be able to uh, be equally represented so they can make decisions that help the collective whole. That's just a rational form of thinking I have. I'm just against any sort of overt action where you prefer uh, someone of a certain gender over another. It leads to all sorts of things. It's a slippery slope, including uh, reverse discrimination, and it's not based on merit. Yeah, I could, I think, write a second dissertation at this point on uh, the systems of bias, oppression, and uh, general ways of politics that keep women out of both politics and, honestly, science as well. And I think that I want to also touch on the other forms of diversity. Because, yeah, I have an issue with quotas, but I also think we need to be encouraging more people to run so they can win in places where they are actually the best person for the job. And it does start with welcoming people in and encouraging them to run. And when it comes to representation, there is a lack of representation for gender diverse people, for people from different visible minorities, and also um, queer representation. So in that conversation, I also find myself really having a worry to do with tokenization. So when people take on roles, whether they're put there for by quota or put there because they've gotten there on their own without any other system of support, there is a danger that we use people in those roles to say, oh, well, we, we accomplished it now. We've reached gender parity. Or, 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 we've reached equality or equity of any kind because we have these people in those roles. We respect them. We're done. So 
So I think the conversation doesn't end there, and I would shy away from ever using kind of an example, especially I mean, I felt this, using an example of a person of color to be like, oh, well, we fixed our diversity problem. Here, last question. If you were elected, how will you ensure government decisions are based on the best available research and evidence? I will advocate um, to uh, use, use the pure science that we've been talking about, uh, to use the most recent uh, research, um, make sure that it isn't biased uh, by big business or paid for by big business, and uh, make, make our policies and our decisions based on what we find to be the truth at that moment, and you know, with the best available data. And uh, I think that's how we can go forward, but also be cognizant that, that these things change, and as we learn more, uh, you know, decisions can change. So with build in some flexibility with that, you know, as we learn more, as the science improves, or as our understanding improves, we can nudge the tiller, as you will, um, in order to, to make those the, the best decision for, for Canada as we move forward. I think there needs to be a balance in terms of pragmatism, business sense, and science when it comes to leaders in the country. You know, it's easy to say that you just want scientists to run everything, and that would be my, you know, most polarized answer to this. But the fact is that you need to have people that also have some business sense and practicality. And this is what my government would do if we were elected. Is elected is that we would start with putting people at the top that are making their decisions based on science, mathematics, economic realities, and they're not influenced by any sort of companies or lobbies. But then you have to also start looking at secondary things such as their own experience running their business. Whether they failed or succeeded, they gotta know what works, what doesn't work, and then they also have to be practical. They just have to look at what can happen now versus what can happen years down the road. My party believes in the elimination of taxes, for example, but we also know it's not gonna happen if we came in, we would have to do it in a phased approach, and that's where you come in with the practicality. So really, it's really important that we start putting leaders in that are scientists. And I think I can say that in this room, that I have a huge bias towards having other academics, people that know what's going on and really understand it. They know the how. They're not gonna go and talk about doing things without knowing exactly how they're gonna do it based on sound principles. This is something that me and my party completely stand by. Yeah, I think the answer to this is, has multiple parts, and one is that we definitely need more scientists in government, overall, every single party. And that will just increase the number of people investigating and going through policy with a science-based and evidence-based lens. And the other key part is the science advisors, because I think that we're, we're never going to have all scientists in government, nor would that be representative. So we need to make sure that every department has access to evidence, and then we create a culture within government where we actually look at that evidence and follow it. And from my personal view, when I'm in, then I can look at every piece of legislation. I'll read through every one, and I'll check for backup data, and I'll encourage other people to do that as well. So at a high level, the Liberal Party is committed to this, and we will continue to have the Chief Science Advisor position. We will continue to strive for building those structures that allow for evidence to get to the decision-making table. But since the question was if I was going to be elected, I can focus a little more specifically on what I would do. Um, my writing, Vancouver East, is in between UBC and Simon Fraser University, which are two of the best universities in Canada, and I've been fortunate enough to go back and forth between the two over my career and represented the grants office, so I have a large network there because people are always looking for money. Um, but I say that to, to really hone in that as a member of parliament, something that I could be doing in this writing is bringing those, those universities together on anything. So when something comes up, we can have a quick round table of all the researchers who are working in that area to, to help give me that information. And I've already started doing that even as a candidate. On my first interview about the opioid crisis, I reached out to researchers who were working on it to make sure that I was bringing forward the best decision making or the best evidence on that topic. So absolutely continue to do that. Would also, on the other side, start working with scientists, my colleagues, um, to understand a little bit more about how the political system works and not try and just publish papers and assume that we're going to take it all up and everything's going to be fine, but to understand the political nuances and do research that is informed by government priorities and what's important to Canada as well. So I push from both sides, locally and federally. 
So we'll do uh, now closing remarks and final rebuttals. Each will actually get three minutes uh, to do that wrap up. And right. you can sit or stand, your choice. Uh, I'll stand for this. So um, yeah, you know this has been a, actually a very interesting uh, event because most of the events I go to, I don't get to have. Um, some pretty esteemed academics sitting next to me. Um, I only have a master's degree in computer science, so definitely the challenge is here, and I, I did not see this in other events, so it's very, very interesting. Uh, definitely, I want to talk more about my party. You know, I do think that the there is a task for government, and it's really about enabling people. It's about giving them the opportunity to get what they deserve. It's giving them the opportunity to work hard and have a chance at success. It's not about guaranteeing equality. I don't think that equality is something you can just get automatically. It's something that has to be earned and the government's job is to prevent it, is to ensure that people can, do, can achieve that. So that's what my party is about. I talked about it earlier about you know balancing uh, fiscal uh, freedoms with social freedoms, and that's what really I believe in. And I think that that's why my government, uh, if we if we took power in Ottawa, we would be able to ensure that this happened. Because ultimately, the complete the basis of our party's liberty, it's about ensuring that you have the natural born right to do whatever it is that you can do, as long as you don't infringe on the rights of other people. It's not about taking away something from you and giving it to someone else. It's about ensuring that you're responsible and you take pride in whatever decisions you made throughout your life. Uh, you know, one of the things that I want to kind of make a commentary now, just going all political, is the fact that I, you know, I've observed many elections in Canada, and you know, we keep ping-ponging between the Liberals and the Conservatives. I didn't see today any sort of, you know, hostility between, uh, you know, these two parties. But in general, when we watch these debates and we hear the news, what we hear are questions being asked of the the Conservative candidate, and they're pointing fingers at the Liberal candidate and vice versa, and we have this sort of insane pattern of going back and forth and choosing the party that, you know, was doing stuff four years ago, and we forget what they did. We have very short time uh, me uh, memory. So it's really important to look at things critically and understand that you don't have to agree with either the Conservatives or Liberals this election. It's okay to disagree with them both. It's called free thinking. And you know there are other options, and sometimes if you see that the same problems that you're trying to solve are not getting solved over and over again, it's time to make some changes and consider some of other options. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to speak to the oddity of where we've gotten to in politics, and that starts with why I'm in politics at all right now. So as a grad student, I uh, got fed up with not having impact. And maybe that's because my research centered around black holes in the early universe and it was completely unreasonable that I would ever do anything related to Earth and that I was stuck with this mindset of, of seeing us as one family on this pale blue dot and realizing that what I needed to dedicate my life to was our continued s s s the prosperity and survival here. Maybe live long and prosper. Um, and so, so I looked back to our terrestrial world and how much I hold it dear and realized that I was completely dissatisfied by the amount of suffering we have around the world, the crises we face, and the need for change. And I felt more than anything the need for impact. And I thought, oh, well, politics is the last thing I want to do, and then maybe there was an election in the US and they elected an orange monster. And I realized that maybe stuff was a little more urgent than I thought, and so I decided I would come home and start from where I knew I could start. And so here I am, trying to become an MP, so that we can start having that change. And I think that we're not as divided as the US is, but what we have here is still a political system of a pendulum that has not worked. And everybody has good ideas, and I think we need to come together to be willing to co cooperate, collaborate, and have a conversation about our collective future. And also, I've realized that I came to this with the lens of diversity and intersectionality and inclusion. And I was, I'll be honest, disappointed to find how necessary that was. So I found that my role in government is to both talk about evidence-based policy and science, collaboration, cooperation, and stuff that scientists know how to do, but also bring the lens of intersectionality to every single conversation of policy, to look at every piece of legislation from many different lenses, and to then work with colleagues 
stop wanting to get credit for anything and say, let's build a future. Let's build a world, a country, where we can grow and thrive together and maybe start to dream big again. Let me stay seated for this one. Um, in closing remarks, I, it really resonates hearing a lot of scientists have this same drive to want to change the world, to want to help, to want to collaborate to fix some of these challenges we're facing and, and have an impact. And I similarly struggle. Our system is set up in science and in graduate school to not really focus on impact. You're working on publications so that you can get a job, and those publications are going to be cited by people, but you're not putting the time in that you need to do to actually have impact, which is collaborating with people, which is building relationships with communities, because that's where the impactful work comes. But our reward system is, is structured right now in a way that keeps us from doing that. Um, and then this is going to be my last pivot into Kiersey Duncan, and I promise you won't hear me say it again. Uh, but seeing her come in as a scientist into politics and actually change the structure of university. So her, her point was to make them more inclusive because the ivory tower has not been always an inclusive place. But she was able, with understanding of the structures, to create the right carrots and sticks to put us on that trajectory. And that's absolutely what I want to continue to do, not just with equity, diversity, and inclusion, but with impact now and collaborations. Uh, Ten-year promotion committees aren't actually evaluating that type of work, and so academics aren't doing that. It's exactly the kind of structural change we need. If people get rewarded for having impact and for working with communities, they're going to do it. They're going to do a really good job. Um, academics are really good at that. Whatever the system is, they'll do a great job of doing it. So I want to continue to do that, and I want to continue to build structures that allow for collaboration with scientists. We only have solutions to the big challenges when we're collaborating. And if we aren't rewarding people and even enabling them to collaborate, they're not going to do it. So I want to continue to build these structures in universities that have us collaborate across sectors and with communities um, for the good of the Earth. It seems like a good statement to stop on. Well, I, I've, I've loved all your closing statements, and I think we should probably have a science party. Yeah. You know, where, uh, you know, reasonable, reasonable thought processes and, and uh, policies are brought forward uh, that are based on, on evidence. Um, I, I, I want to speak just a little bit more about um, the diversity and the inclusion. Companies work best when you have uh, people from all walks and all races and all genders working together. And when I was in the field, uh, in, in field camps that were all men, it was not, uh, obviously it was not a very diverse environment, and those camps were very dysfunctional. And it was interesting, um, you know, you had 20 guys living together, and as soon as there were three or four women brought in, Everybody behaved themselves, everybody was respectful, people were uh, much more, um, re yeah, respectful and, and human uh, with each other. And I, I think that politics is the same. I think the more women we get in there, um, we need to support them. We need the media to lay off the women. We need the media not to ask questions like, oh, how many children do you have? Oh, what's that you're wearing? Oh, what have you done with your hair? That has to stop. We need to be treated just like, the, they would never ask a guy these questions. So why on earth would they ask a woman? So the, I think the media has to lay off the women. And uh, I also find that I don't have as thick skin as I would pretend to. I find that the social media comments that, uh, that some of the trolls make are, are difficult. So you know, in order to encourage women to come out step forward, whether the background is science, whether it's technology, whether it's engineering, or, or even investment banking, um, we need to make it a safe, supportive space and we will get the top-notch women stepping forward into politics, or, or men, or queer, or it doesn't matter, but it needs to be a space where people are respected. Um, and I think that's why a lot of really talented people don't step forward. So. Um, the Conservative Party is, is pushing um, definitely an uh, inclusive uh, platform and uh, I'm here to sort of say that, that I'm part of that and uh, I will fully advocate for that moving forward as an MP.
Thank you very much. Um, on the note about a science party, we like to think of Swiss and, and our member party, our member organizations that we, we have community partners. Some of our events definitely are like a party, um, as well as bringing in different people, bringing different ideas, being diverse. Uh, and then we also say about having that evidence, that research. So Swiss uh, starting a provincial election a few years ago, we started to use political debates. This year we've had four cities across Canada. Victoria was last night, Ottawa's next week, um, and then Montreal was uh, the previous week. So this is part of uh, bringing it out to more and more people. There will be, I know, there was some tweeting. We're going to be looking at a video, potentially going to be posting that online um, once it gets approved to through different candidates. So there's there's more to come. Uh, if you know anybody, know anybody in Ottawa, we'd love uh, to invite them out there. It's Wednesday next week. And I will hand it over now to our MC, who I know has a few closing remarks. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody. Really just to thank our uh, great candidate. I found that extremely interesting uh, as a uh, science adjacent uh, medical officer. And first time votes, I found it genuinely interesting. I thought the questions were great, uh, which were submitted uh, through Swiss. Mm -hmm. So thanks to everybody that submitted questions if you're, if you're here. Um, I thought it was very informative, so I hope you will uh, find it equally uh, enjoyable as I did. Um, we're not doing a Q&A, but I think if uh, there's time uh, for people to interact, maybe afterwards informally, uh, any, any follow-up questions, uh, get in line behind me. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, thanks very much, and thanks to Kelly Martinu for uh, moderating, President Swiss, and also to Maria for timekeeping. So thanks very much. So we have the venue until 9 o'clock, uh, so we had sort of put this time now until 9 if you want to do networking, meet and greet with the candidates, uh, opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. But, uh, I don't think I've been so much pleasure such a long time. Yeah, that's the most fun to be. Hey, we need to be, become a Swiss member. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.